Professor Dieter Helm, it's a great pleasure to host you here in the Polish Embassy in London. And I thank you very much because uh, uh, you will be the one opening also Precop in Krakow, although via video. Uh, but uh, we will have you uh, in, uh, during the discussion that will be held in Krakow. And uh, I would like this discussion to be quite uh, ambitious uh, in terms of objective, is to think about uh, what kind of civilization do we want uh, for the second half of the 21st century, given objectives of the Paris Agreement. And you have worked extensively on uh, energy. Uh, for uh, recent years. And I wanted to explore with you uh, this field about the future of energy. Uh, and uh, how can we imagine the future of energy for uh, planet Earth? And uh, what can we, what should we expect and to where can we act in this regard? Um, uh, and uh, I would like to then to first to start with an easy question, if you don't mind. What will be the future of energy in 2050? So just an easy question to start with. And part of the answer to that is we don't know. So in my lifetime, when uh, I started out, I had a typewriter, Tipex, carbon paper, and there were no fax machines. And if you told me uh, back in the 1980s that I would have an incredibly powerful computer in my pocket, uh, and that there would be something called the internet, etc. It, it would have been inconceivable, part of science fiction. And we have to always be open to that. The possibilities of human ingenuity are enormous, and the possibility of scientific breakthrough is substantive. Now that said, there are some things we do know, and we can know pretty clearly about 250. The first thing is we know that we won't be short of energy. So the sun comes up every day, and the sun delivers in one hour more energy than the entire world's electricity system produces in a year. So we're not short of solar energy, and we've got more fossil fuels than we could possibly need to fry the planet many times over. So the one thing that is going to be true in 250 is that we're not going to be short of energy. The second thing we know is that quite a lot of the energy generating technologies, the infrastructure, will still be there. People building nuclear power stations today build them for 60 years. So we know quite a lot of that's going to be there. And in addition, we know that there are going to be really big technological transformations in the economies which energy serves. And of all of those things, the thing that really counts is what digitalization of economies means. Robotics, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, big data, et cetera. And we know this, digitalization, digital technologies, the digital economies we're gonna have are going to be electric. It's the only serious way in which you can power robots and all the things that go with them. And so therefore, in 220, it's all about electricity and it's all about how that electricity is generated in a world where oil and gas and to an extent coal will be relevant largely in as far as they service the electricity industry oh, and make petrochemicals. So it will be the age of electricity the same way that the 20th century is probably the age of oil? Yes. So the 19th century was the age of coal. The 20th century was actually the age of coal and oil and eventually gas. And we know from this century going forward, bar some extraordinary invention, that we are going into an age of electricity. And all the focus within the frame of thinking about um, uh, the Paris Agreement, et cetera, at least in as far as the energy sector is concerned, is going to be about electricity. Electric cars, electric transport, electric factories, and of course, electricity generation. And this last, uh, because the whole point is, uh, where does this energy come from? So. Can we imagine already now, taking into account all technologies uh, that are available today, or regulatory frameworks or efforts, but also, as you mentioned, there is such a big uncertainty on technology that it makes all our predictions uh, a little bit uh, uh, difficult. But can we imagine from today's perspective 
that in 32 years time exactly in 2050 what will be the electricity generated uh, from well the answer to that question is it depends on what we do now because 30 years three decades is not a long time and you know the infrastructure turns over fairly slowly so the question is are we actually going to create the space the energy policy frameworks and create the technologies in order that more and more of that can be low carbon or renewable and of those spaces the big unknown because it's the area where there's the biggest potential scope for progress is solar and if you look at solar it's abundant there's no shortage of the sun this comes up every day okay there are two problems with solar the first is how much of the light spectrum do you capture and things like photosynthesis what plants do is incredibly inefficient so the big questions are about the infrared part of the light spectrum and ultraviolet. And as we move into the infrared bit, the capacity of solar it goes up enormously. But then the second thing is, how do you translate that light that's been captured into usable electricity? And right now, solar, like lots of these technologies, is pretty primitive. You stick it on panels, and you stick panels in fields, or you stick them on roofs, and, and that's how you do it. Well, imagine a world where you could spray on solar film onto anything. So instead of having panels, you just have film. And you spray it onto buildings, cars, shoes, your clothes. You, sp you spray it onto the roads. You think about a really wide application. Now, to do that, you need new materials. And you need things like graphene uh, and other ways of having very thin carbon uh, fabrics to do some of this stuff. Is this possible? We know in both cases that great progress is being made. It's not being made by installing solar panels. It's being made in universities, in labs, by scientists. And these are the areas which will make our future or not. And that's why 250 is so unclear. You, you said we shouldn't build panels as they are today, but that's, if I remember, uh, the motivation behind Energy Wende, for example, mm. the German mm. reform on, uh, on yes. electricity is that by building uh, a lot of renewables, mm. uh, wind, uh, but mm. uh, solar panels mm. also, mm. Uh, we can drive the cost down mm -hmm. and so it will become available for everybody mm -hmm. and uh, it will uh, spread. And it's already somehow partly happening because the cost of, of solar panels mm. Mm. Uh, in recent tenders uh, mm. uh, in uh, sunny uh, mm. states is less than uh, than traditional conventional uh, power plant so we shouldn't do that you're packing a lot of different assumptions into the same question if i can put it that way so the first thing is i, I never suggested I would never suggest that you shouldn't build existing panels. Okay? The question isn't whether you should build them, and it isn't whether the costs will come down. Of course they'll come down, and they've fallen quite substantially. It's about whether you should put all your money into that basket, or whether you should spend some of that money on research and next-generation technologies. And the truth is that R&D is very, very cheap in comparison with deploying existing technologies. You know, we don't spend a billion on this, but we spend tens of billions on offshore wind, for example. And I know it causes a lot of trouble and you get lots of reactions, but just to suggest that we'd spend, you know, one billion less on these things and one billion more on the next generation of technology, that's extremely important. The second thing is this extraordinary argument that the energy vendor in Germany was a great success. It was pretty disastrous. Why? Well, let's remember the main parts of the energy vendor. The most important part was to close the nuclear power stations and build coal instead. So Germany has built 13 gigawatts of new coal since, 220, uh, since 2000. It's been a big dash for coal. It won't even achieve its 220 targets. And as for the subsidies, this is over 20 billion per annum subsidies that German consumers are paying for cost advantages which have taken place in Chinese factories and elsewhere. So the whole idea of the energy vendor was it was going to be a great German industrial enterprise. 
and German and European countries were gonna, uh, companies were going to stride the world leading in renewables. Actually, what we did was imported a lot of stuff from China. It was great for China. It's great export. We don't have great European companies dominating the manufacture of these things. And the net result in Germany, if you compare it with a country like the UK, is Germany is brown, not green. We have closed our coal. We have not closed our nuclear power stations. And we have invested in offshore wind as well as solar, but on a more modest scale. So we have to be very careful here. It's, it's you know, pe people say, oh, you're against wind farms, or you're against offshore wind, or you're against solar panels. Not a bit of it. It's just that we have to bear in mind that ordinary people only have so much money to spend. And ultimately, all these subsidies are paid, not by you and me, but by people struggling to make ends meet. And we should be precious about the amount of money they've got to spend. And we should spend it where we're going to get the best climate change bucks we're going to get. And I would argue, that we should have spent it rather differently than we did, but I wouldn't argue we sh anything about saying, you know, we shouldn't build wind farms or whatever, or solar panels. Great, that helps. And by the way, on the falling costs of solar, true, solar costs have come down dramatically, and that's great. It's really good progress. But be very careful of two things. First of all, there's a world of difference between building solar panels in one of the darkest countries in Europe, which is Germany, uh, it's quite serious. It's not where you want to build them. You want to build them in sunny places and think about the networks and transmission to bring them from North Africa, from Spain and elsewhere into the European market. And secondly, do bear in mind that it isn't just the cost of generating the solar that counts. It's the cost of generating secure supplies of energy. And remember, solar has one huge problem in Northern Europe, which is in winter, it's dark. And therefore, when power is most needed, you have to build something else instead at the moment to back it up, and that means the cost of solar are the full cost of the energy supplied on a secure basis and not simply the unit cost of a particular panel, which has improved dramatically. And the same applies to wind. Uh, when the wind is no, not blowing, uh, the electricity is not produced. And uh, But it's slightly different in wind. In wind, wind is not uh, affected by day-night, it's not affected by the darkness of, of winter. Uh, so wind is variable, but right through the year. And actually, you tend to get more wind, wind in winter, except for those short periods of very high pressure which we get. So we haven't solved that intermittency problem either, but it's very important to realise that the intermittency problem from wind is a very different problem from the intermittency problem of solar. Uh, and when we think about storage technologies, batteries, using electric cars to spill energy into the electricity systems, all these new ways of managing intermittency, it's quite a lot easier to do it in wind than it is in solar, uh, except in as far as at least you can predict very clearly when you're not going to have the solar energy, which is on average 12 hours a day in Europe. So... There is something uh, well, uh, which, is, which is puzzling. Uh, on one side, we say uh, solar and wind uh, intermittent uh, need for backup or storage. Uh, and the other side, you, you, you somehow place your hopes uh, for the future on, of, of elect uh, electricity generation in new technologies uh, linked with solar. But irrespective of how powerful it will be, um, whether we will be uh, walking in uh, uh, solar producing clothes or running in uh, solar producing cars, still it will be very complicated to uh, solve this problem of day and night. And oh. so the question of intermittency yes. uh, will be with us. Yes. So here you might be surprised with this comment, but I think by 250 we'll have solved the problem of intermittency. Now, why do I say that? Okay. Now, first thing is that st batteries and storage are advancing really quickly. This is about science. This is about uh, developing uh, new batteries like solid state rather than lithium ion, etc. Huge research program going on. You can go to any major university in the world and find the engineering departments and the science departments working on storage. It's very exciting. It's why, by the way, I have a mobile phone in my pocket, this computer, 
the transformation in computing for laptops and mobiles was the transformation of batteries. The original ones were huge and didn't last very long. Now we have to move on. Of course, electric cars will drive that. So storage on batteries. But here's the other thing. Smart data and smart meters means that demand is much more manageable. So we can know a great deal more about when to increase or decrease supply. We can moderate how houses and buildings use demand. And of course, we can spill the electricity from cars into the normal electricity system and back again. So, because, you know, if you drive a car, on average, it'll be half full of fuel, or so will your battery be. So the storage side is a big story. But here's the thing that most people miss. The economy itself will digitalize. Okay. If you've got a digital factory, imagine a digital car factory. Okay. So when do you produce? Okay. Do you produce at night or during the day? Can you turn it on and turn it off? Okay. Now, if you go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years in this country, most car factories closed in August because the workers went on holiday. It was known as the August holiday. You can see it's still across Europe. So they just closed down and did the maintenance thing. Okay. Well, if it turns out that intermittency is a really big problem in January and February when it's cold, you just turn the robots off. It's not like sending workers home. It's not the infra you become the whole economy becomes flexible. Okay? So the intermittency problem itself goes down. Your house is digitally organized. You charge things when you need to. And then you've got battery storage on top of it and other forms of storage. Okay? So what this means is that the intermittency gets gradually solved. And of course, so we're thinking out to 250 and beyond. In that world, I can readily imagine, barring some breakthrough I haven't thought of, and there'll be loads of them, that we can describe a solar world where solar is much more efficient working against a digital economy, which is flexible, and uh, one which has huge storage potential. So I can envisage all of those things. And then, of course, the worry in the winters in the north, where you've got the darkness, that's about long-distance transmission. So you can think of the Middle East being a solar factory <laughs> with long-distance uh, you know, DC links bringing stuff into Europe and elsewhere. That's another technical breakthrough. We need to advance the cabling. So all of that's possible and plausible. Whether it can be done in time for what the IPCC want and what Paris wants, I doubt it. But that doesn't mean that we're not on course to crack these problems in this century. Mm -hmm. Solving the problem of intermittency, I think it's, uh, it's really the, the, the heart of the, of the issue. And, uh, and I'm very excited by your optimistic mm. view regarding this. And indeed, taking uh, the parallel with the phone, uh, when we were born, uh, when in, in Poland, uh, phone was uh, uh, very rare yeah. um, at that time uh, apparatus. So then when I only grew up that we had a phone, but it was a stationary phone linked to, by cable. Yeah. Uh, and that was also due to the necessity to, to, to charge it permanently, yeah. yes? Yeah. Right now we are having this intermittent phone, if I may say, yes. Yes. <laughs> which, is, uh, which, is, which is having a great autonomy. So that is uh, something I can, uh, the, with taking into account the, the curves of decreasing cost of batteries, I can, I, I, I can imagine. But, but there is something else on which I, I, I've been working quite extensively, which is demand response. Yes. And uh, uh, my experience uh, and, and a number of other people's uh, uh, was that uh, the demand response from households is not as ambitious as we think. So the, the, the households are, do not organize their life around energy cost. Yeah. Uh, despite the, the yeah. our dreams, if I may say, from yeah. um, so uh, this flexibility is has a very limited potential. When we we did some exercises in Poland, we found out that between fifteen up to twenty percent only of households were responsive even to uh, not very big but still uh, yeah. uh, changes in terms of of tariffs. Others simply don't care. They want electricity. They consider it's yeah. a normal. Um, uh, I mean, I, I sometimes use the word that uh, 
even the wording that the people start to consider it as a human right yes. uh, in developed world, yes, yes? yes. Uh, uh, which is completely different from developing world where more than one billion people are living in yes. energy poverty. But in this regard, uh, being in a in an ex- economy in a flexible economy driven by cost of ele- uh, energy, isn't it? Uh, a little bit ambitious. In so, 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 so the, the, there's, there's a fundamental mistake when it comes to energy efficiency. There are all these studies that show that there's enormous scope for energy efficiency and it's really cheap and people would be better off if they you know, made their houses more efficient, etc. And they don't. And there are two conclusions you can draw. One is you can draw the, the conclusion they don't care. The other is you can draw the conclusion that they're too stupid to understand what to do. And I think both of those are wrong completely wrong and the mistake here is to expect people to actually positively do stuff what the new smart technologies do is do it for you okay so you think think about cars and transport autonomous vehicles are going to do the job for you you don't want to spend your time keep going up to the meter to check the price of electricity and what you're using you've got better things to do and there are more distractions you want it done for you. Now imagine a world where you have a broadband hub in your house, fibre to the house, and all your white goods in your house, your boilers, everything else, connect to the smart meter and the broadband hub. And it works out how to optimise your house against the various supplies of electricity coming on. So for example, it's very windy and a lot of manufacturing plants aren't operating, electricity is cheap. It loads down that electricity into your system, turns your heating system on, cools down your uh, fridge, does everything, okay? And then another point is a real pinch point. It does it for you. So it optimizes your house to give you the best bill for the parameters that you want, okay? Now, this isn't the same thing as trying to reduce energy demand. Energy efficiency is about using energy well, effectively, Reducing energy demand, which is what a lot of Europeans think they're going to do. Why? Who wants to reduce electricity demand? We want to re- reduce the demand for fossil fuel generated energy. Right? But if it's solar, why would you want to reduce the demand? If all the wind turbines are turning around, use it. Marginal cost is free. It's not polluting anything. So this is the distinction. But this is the digitalization of households. Okay, and. This takes over lots of things which we've got totally used to on apps and our phones. We get things done for us. You know, if you go and listen to one of these uh, music apps, Spotify or whatever, they'll put you on there a set of music for you to listen to. It's worked out what you want. It's put it together. You no longer have to bother. It's done for you. And that's why I want to think about energy. It's not about making people do things. It's about providing the technology which produces a cheaper and better outcome for people and optimise the system. And that helps to solve intermittency. Imagine the following. You drive your car into the supermarket car park. You go and do your shopping. There's a plate on the, uh, underneath your car on the, where you park. And it just loads up with your car computer, checks the wind speed, works out whether the system's in surplus or deficit, and either takes power out of your battery or charges up your battery. You don't do a thing. All you do is have a contract to supply you with electricity with the parameters of the mileage you want to do with your car. All these technologies are coming. We're perfectly happy with apps, particularly younger people. Their whole phone is covered in apps doing this stuff for them but they can't quite make the step to realise that's what's going to happen in their house. But it is. And that's part of digitalisation. And that's part of the transformation which makes uh, for our new energy world not that far in the future. A very exciting future. Uh, You mentioned electric car. Uh, In Poland, we have just set up a very ambitious plan for uh, electric cars. because we think that uh, it's part of the answer not only to transport and environmental problems, but also to energy yes. demand in the future. But the, uh, the, the answer today is not obvious. I mean, we are not yet able uh, to have this exchange of uh, energy or, or information between electric car and oil car. And the second, I think, more fundamental question, you, you seem very sure 
but by, by, that by 2050 we will be driving electric cars. Yeah. What makes you so sure? Okay, so there are two parts of this. The easy bit is why I'm sure about it, okay? And that's because all the great car companies in the world are investing enormous sums of money in it. And that's virtually unstoppable. The idea that the, the BMWs, the Audis, the Fords, the, uh, the VWs, the, the Chryslers, all these people are going to now reverse gear. That seems extremely unlikely. And remember, the enormous pressure for electric cars comes from urban pollution. That's the big story. And China is investing heavily. So it's just a wall of money going into this problem. And since the problem is perfectly solvable, right, we will expect that to produce results. Okay? So that's the first part. Now, the second part is, why is it so difficult to get the take-up of these vehicles? Well, some of it's pretty obvious. So if you want a smart car, you know, doing automatic, um, you know, self-driving, all that kind of stuff, okay? The first thing you need to do is have the digital infrastructure to do it. So in the UK, 4% is fibre, right? So there are whole chunks of the country with primitive broadband. I have a house in the southwest of, of Britain where there is no mobile phone coverage, right? I can get mobile phone coverage at the top of the Alps, but I can't get them in rural Britain. Lucky you. Yes. Uh, one of the last places. Yes. Difficult height. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it has many advantages, okay, to escape this modern technology. But the point I'm making is you can't have electric cars working until you've got, seriously, electrically fibre-enabled roads. You have to have everywhere the IT, and you have to have the security too because someone like the, the banks fail every now and then to, to in their IT systems, this system's got to be pretty secure, okay? So it's part of creating the digital economy or the infrastructure for the digital economy of which energy is a part, okay? So you've got to do that first. Then you've got to sort out the charging system, okay? So you and I, I'm sure, charge our cars, if you have a fossil fuel car like I do, at a petrol station on a motorway. Well, the electricity grid was never designed to serve motorway service stations. They're usually a long way away. And when people want fast charging, you need a different kind of grid. So what I would say is, in electrifying transport, I think the most important things are to get the fiber in place first and to get the power electricity network in place so that people have the confidence that they can have the range and effectiveness for their vehicles. And this is kind of chicken and egg. You don't know when it's going to crack. You don't know when we're going to switch to electric. Maybe governments force us to do it. But at some point, we get there. And this is where governments need to think about core infrastructure. So you take something like fibre. It's good for everything. It's good for manufacturing, it's good for households, it's good for banking, it's good for social inclusion, it's good for watching all those Netflix movies, right? You know, it's a good thing, it's a general enabling technology. And so this is where people want to start talking about energy transitions, right? Rather than simply saying, I've got this electric car which has got a battery with a following kind of range. Fine, where are you going to charge it, right? Who's going to download the data, right? Where's the smart points? And that's back to why households will be enabled. Households can't be enabled to be efficient unless you've got really good broadband. And the trick on this is to realise, you know, compared with building high-speed rail networks and all this stuff, broadband is really cheap. It's about the best investment that any major economy could possibly make. In the case of the UK, the entire Britain is about half the cost of the HS2 high-speed railway people are talking about building. I mean, it's just extraordinary. It's not expensive. And the payoff is big. But you need to do that in order to make the electric cars take forward. Now, it's possible it's hydrogen instead. People talk about fuel cells. But remember, you've got to make the hydrogen. And that requires effectively electricity. Okay? And so we may have fuel cells. We may have some hydrogen based to this. We may find something else. right? But all the major car companies in the world have put their bet on electric cars. And I think that's probably going to tell. And uh, do you think then that uh, in the coming years, uh, the cost of uh, electric vehicle will be lower than the cost of traditional vehicle? Because ultimately, 
we as customers, uh, we will decide uh, not because of uh, uh, our beliefs, although it's a part of the population which is driven by, mm. uh, by uh, principles, mm. but most of us uh, are driven by simply uh, cost-benefit yes. analysis. Yes. So is it possible and what would be the time frame uh, to make uh, electric vehicles cost competitive. Uh... Right. So, so, so we need to be clear here, okay? The reason why, one of the reasons why fossil fuel driven conventional cars are cheaper than electric cars is because the fossil fuel car does not pay for the pollution it imposes on everyone else. So if you go around in London, where we are now, and look out in the street, the air quality here is not far different from Beijing, Paris, and Delhi. It's awful. Very bad indeed. Violates the EU requirements substantially. Why? Because it's diesel vehicles out there. Okay? Now, 40 to 50,000 people in the UK die prematurely because of air pollution. Okay? So we pay in the National Health Service, right, in all the costs to those people. It's not just the people who die. It's their lungs, their life enjoyment is affected, etc. When I drive my car, I don't pay those costs. Right? I'm the pollution I'm paying. So if you think about the true costs of fossil fuel cars and the true costs of electric cars, and then think about the speed the cost curve declines just through the volume effects, like the solar panels that people go for learning, it's not that far away. And remember also, a lot of what you do when you buy a car is tax. <laughs> Uh, indeed, but bringing externalities into yes. uh, the uh, yes. uh, the cost uh, yes. of, of the car is not only an economic; it's also a political issue. Of course. Um, and um, uh, when we see, and uh, uh, in Poland, the, 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 that's pretty much the same numbers. Also, the population is mm. smaller. Forty-five thousand people are dying prematurely mm. every year because of uh, air pollution. Mm. And Poland hosts a very uh, unpleasant record of having 36 out of 50 most polluted cities mm. in the European Union, mm. uh, which is still the, mm. uh, the, the, the heritage of the past. But uh, in this regard, uh, I think it might, be, it might not be obvious to, to bring all these externalities uh, to, to put on the weight of, of internal combustion engine. But at the same time, we have... Uh, a, a declining cost of batteries and the fact yeah. that uh, electric vehicles are much simpler and so uh, much less expensive yeah. to operate. Uh, so already now, when I see some calculations for logistic companies, uh, post uh, offices, also for predictable mm -hmm. roads mm -hmm. uh, in cities mm -hmm. for minivans or mm -hmm. uh, delivery, uh, mm -hmm. Um, on, 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 on given uh, mm. paths, uh, it seems that total cost of ownership uh, of electric vehicle starts to be quite comparable with total cost yeah. of ownership of uh, yeah. IC. And when this uh, will evolve in the coming years, probably the, the, the decline of the cost curve on, uh, on the side of the electric vehicle will be, will be quicker than the, the efforts done on the side of the internal combustion engine. So in this regard only, uh, wouldn't uh, electric vehicles be, be a more expanded? Okay, so all of those trends seem to me to correct, but it is a mistake to believe that technical progress doesn't happen in fossil fuels. So let me give an example. In 2005, 2006, when the Europeans had convinced themselves the oil price was going to go to $200 a barrel. Most European leaders believed that, unbelievably, but they believed it. Um, uh, shale gas and shale oil were just being developed in the United States. Within one decade, America had turned itself from a declining oil producer to add 3 million barrels a day through the new technologies of shale oil development. If you look at what's happened in cars and the speed with which the internal combustion engine's efficiency has been improved, this is a moving feast. So we need both that uh, the electric cars become cheaper, which they will. We need major advances in battery technology, 
which we'll almost certainly get, but we need to do that fast enough to keep pace with two things. The fact that the com competition in the uh, internal combustion uh, sector will get more intense. And here's the final twist, which is that if we really are going out of oil and we're going towards this decarbonized world, the oil producers will realize that the oil in the ground is going to be worth less tomorrow than today. So they're going to pump more. So one of the things that differentiates my approach to uh, the period over the next 30, 40 years from nearly all the conventional thinking is I expect the oil price to fall. And I expect it to fall sharply as countries from Saudi Arabia to Russia and elsewhere scramble to provide the last barrel. And so the competitive landscape is not a level line against which fossil, uh, which electric and uh, decarbonized technologies just get more efficient. Both are getting more efficient, and that puts uh, a big pressure on. I've no doubt the electric cars will win. And by the way, of course, the politicians will drive this too. So they're not waiting to adjust the difference. They're talking about banning fossil fuel vehicles. And of course, once a car producer sees that they aren't, can't sell uh, fossil fuel engines, and they see that the customers are going to be compelled to buy the electricity ones, then of course they get on with producing them en masse. You know, just Dieselgate and the problems of diesel pollution have led to dramatic falls in the sales of diesel vehicles across Europe, and especially in the UK. These things matter. So it's regulation and price and technical advance, all of those things come together. And how exactly they work out between now and 250, nobody knows. But you can kind of sketch in some of the bits. But there'll be predictable surprises, and there'll be what Donald Rumsfeld once called unknown unknowns. <laughs> my mobile phone in my pocket is an unknown unknown 25 years ago. The iPhone is only 10 years old. So the other part of this, the really optimistic bit, is human ingenuity is extraordinary when given a challenge. And uh, if I look around my university, if I look around what's going around, around the world, there's so many startups, there's so many new businesses, there are so many people who once idealistically wanted to explore a new bit of the world, now they want to crack climate change. And harnessing what's mostly young people, technology, universities, business ideas, entrepreneurship, this is a space which it's incredibly exciting. Thank it's, you. It's, it's, it's amazing. And thank you very much. Last question then, if you allow, because that's uh, the perspective that you are uh, uh, de developing is a perspective, well, for, for Europe, uh, which is exciting. Also for Poland, uh, the fact that diesel cars are being less and less popular in Germany is not obviously only a good thing as many secondhand old diesels are uh, floating uh, the market. Uh, but that is an issue that we have to solve uh, at the level of uh, politics. But what about what about China, India, Africa? Can they switch also to electric vehicles? And what will happen with the oil producers when oil is uh, without any that much value as it is today? The, it's a completely different world that we can that that uh, that uh, that we are imagining and uh, so in projecting ourselves by by 2050 with energy gives us in fact a completely different world i, I think that's absolutely right and you know in my burnout book i uh, the middle section of the book is about what happens to oil producers when we we stop using oil and you know saudi arabia was a small desert kingdom uh it's had a massive population explosion it was very little, it got big on oil, and one of the prospects is it returns to its former littleness. And for Russia, this is a huge threat. Russia's always been a natural resources economy. And imagine a world where we don't want the gas and we don't want the oil out of Russia. If you look at the financial position of these countries, and, and from a geopolitical point of view, we should worry about the uh, unexpected consequences of economies suddenly finding themselves in very different places. I think it's quite dangerous. In terms of the, the Chinas, the Africas, and the India, China's different. China's a 
autocratic country, the Communist Party believes that its grip on power depends on delivering ever higher standard of living, and the ever higher standard of living has been based on carbon intensive and energy intensive exports. That's a, quite a shock to come. Uh, it's got its problems in its cities, and it sees world demand for electric vehicles and so on, and it's in the game. But remember, it's basically a coal economy. For what all the chat and all the propaganda, this is an economy which is highly polluting, and it's the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases by a long way now, and it's increasing those emissions. When you turn to India, and especially Africa, um, there's a perfect possibility these countries just skip a technology. So if you think about fixed link phones, why would you bother in lots of African countries just use mobiles? You don't have all the legacy stuff, right? With solar and flexible solar in parts of Africa, why do you want to build an electricity grid? Okay. So actually there are some really innovative possibilities here which enable these countries, because they don't have all the legacy that we have in Europe, to go one stage further. And for Europe, I mean, the really exciting thing about all this is this is about ideas, it's about technology, it's about science, it's about value added. It's not about labour costs, it's not about social security, it's about ingenuity, brain power, and you need for that a culture that's open, democratic, uh, internationally minded. And you think about transition that's taken place in Poland since the coming down of the Berlin Wall and the coming down of the, uh, the Soviet Union. And what a transformation. Right? And imagine all that in ingenuity, all that entrepreneurial skill let loose on this new market for which Europe should be extremely well placed. Robotics aren't cost competitive against cheap labour in the Far East. You don't need labour. Right? Robots don't need welfare either. We can, and 3D printing means you can do localised manufacturing production. Add to that with just the ingenuity of the whole of European culture. What an opportunity. <laughs> Professor, well, thank you very much thank for you. this extremely uh, exciting journey to the future. Uh, I look forward to finish your book, Burnout, which is uh, truly uh, very interesting and very exciting. And uh, thank you very much for this discussion. And I hope uh, to be able to continue it one day, maybe during COP24 in Katowice. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.